Are you confident your ship can get in and out undetected? We don't call it the ghost for nothing. What's up, Meta Nerds? In this complete breakdown, we'll pull from every source of information out there to fully understand the Ghost, Phantom 1, and Phantom 2, one of the most unique and practical combinations of ships in history. This is a modified VCX-100 light freighter produced by Corellian Engineering Corporation, the same company that produced the famed YT series and YV series freighters, as well as the Gazanti, Baleen, and a whole lot more. Being one of the largest shipwrights in the galaxy, with countless freighters of the same model being seen over thousands of worlds, was one of the first aspects of this craft that made it perfect for a rebel group. Like Han Solo and his YT-1300, everyone from self-serving criminals to freedom fighters would pick ubiquitous craft that could easily blend in. And with CEC designs, they were known for their modularity, selling all sorts of products that could be attached in myriad ways, so even a modified version of these craft wasn't really out of the ordinary. But first, let's thank Pixel Starships for sponsoring this video. They just put a new update. It's got a whole bunch of really new powerful things. I just tried to fight some giant uh, dreadnought thing. I got, it actually didn't die, but it uh, timed out because the battle was so long and tense. But at least I killed a whole bunch of their crew. Luckily, I'm mining plenty of gas and ore, so I'll be able to upgrade a lot of things and then we'll take them next time. I think you guys will really like this game. It has everything from ship building, MMO mechanics, all kinds of exploration even text uh, adventure series, like some of those older games, and even boss battles with cool little side-scroller action going on. Hostile fleets and worlds, and tons of cool little lore that I was surprised at. Don't let the cute pixel art fool you, there is a ton of depth to this game. You'll learn the best ways to target your enemies, it's really fun redesigning and leveling up your ship. Random events as you travel and seeing even real players out there, which you can also PvP fight with. Mysterious fleets and even quirky trading ships that you'll meet. The game is always being updated. This last one has a ton of new weapons. Everything's stronger. The ships are bigger. It's really fun. Download the game from the link below and receive 100 free Starbucks. Enter the code METANERDS125 to receive an additional 125 Starbucks on top of that. So I'll see you in space. It would cost 155,000 credits fresh off the lot, which is about one and a half times the cost of the YT-1300, and only 5k more than an X-Wing. At a length of 43.9 meters or 144 feet, it was about an A-Wing plus Jawa triplets longer than the Millennium Falcon. Being 14.5 meters or 48 feet tall made it taller than a four-story building or a bit shorter than a pair of ties. While at a width of 34.2 meters or 112 feet, it was about three X-Wings across or about two semi-trucks long, three tall, and 14 across. With a top atmospheric speed of 1,025 kilometers per hour or 637 miles per hour, it's right around the X-Wing and notably faster than the YT-1300. To put this in context, that 200 kilometer per hour difference between these two freighters is the same gap between the X-Wing and TIE Fighter. And the TIE is considered to be remarkably quick, so compared to its freighter friends, it would have been shockingly fast. This power was generated by a pair of main engines and two secondary engines, while the hyperdrive rating was a standard class 2 with a backup class 14. It was allowed to be sold with weaponry, but stock it was just a pair of CEC dual laser turrets, which would have likely been low power. Enough to make the citizen feel like they could fight off some simple pirates, but nothing the Emperor had to worry about being used against his imps. But the Ghost would come to have a dorsal laser cannon turret, a nose-mounted laser cannon turret, one Tamenback MS-2B twin laser cannon, and one Tamenback KX-4 dorsal laser turret, as well as two proton torpedo launchers. The laser cannon turrets would have been modified to fire military-grade bolts. Obviously, the proton torpedo launchers were highly illegal and difficult to acquire, while Tamenback was a military defense contractor, making everything from the laser cannons on the X-Wings to the turbo lasers on Star Destroyers. And those weapons were a part of the VCX Auxiliary Starfighter attached to the back. This attaching feature being one of the greatest examples of Corellian Engineering Corporation's modular designs, as it can seamlessly dock with the Ghost, making it act like a mothership, something usually only seen in much larger craft. And it's the only one I can think of where the connection is so seamless, while allowing all the guns to still be used while docked, providing excellent cover during space battles where every ship is trying to maneuver to get behind you. The Auxiliary Fighter is only about an Ewok shorter than the X-Wing, and only costs 22,000 credits. Though I'd guess that's some sort of marketing, it's way too cheap for it to be sold like that by itself. It must be some way that they upsell you on the VCX-100. For just 20 grand more, you get a whole Starfighter-slash-shuttle. It required only a single pilot to operate, and could accommodate four passengers. 
would not come with a hyperdrive or shielding, though a hyperdrive and astromech socket would be installed by Quarry, the mad Mon Calamari engineer that created the B-Wing prototype. And then the Phantom would go from being carried on the back of the Ghost to being the bearer of this prototype, acting like the hyperdrive rings used by the Delta-7. Overcoming the issue of the blade wing losing its power when it fired that prototype beam weapon, and then was too drained to activate its own hyperdrive. This mission also showed us that they often carry spare parts, but the damage suffered when they tried to land on Quarry's world was too great. The Phantom had magnetic clamps used to attach to other ships, and different surfaces and structures like the spire on Stygian Prime. We know what some of the buttons in the cockpit do, at least this blue and white one is the comms and acts like a jamming signal display. And both the Phantom and the Ghost have helpful ship visualizer data screens on the right side of the cockpit. You can still work on repairs for the Phantom while it's docked with the Ghost. And there is a diagnostic panel located on the Ghost side of the bulkhead, that way someone can coordinate with the person doing the repairs. And a record of this is kept in the computer to access the history, which is how Zeb realized that they missed the fuel tank damage alert. And when there was a fuel leak, it didn't take long for it to run completely empty, and obviously it wasn't as heavily armored as the mothership, so both scrapes and bumps from the terrain or incoming fire would damage the Phantom pretty quickly. The Phantom can dock forward or reverse, allowing it to be even more concealed if need be, but mostly used to make it easier to attach. In the middle of combat, you could just fly straight in as fast as you could, but when you had some downtime, you could back it in. Hera was able to outrun TIE fighters in the Phantom with her excellent piloting skills, being able to use terrain to her advantage, and using the dorsal turret to deliver precision shots into pursuing TIEs. And she was able to pick up on the most minor of damage to the ship, being more sensitive than the actual sensor arrays. Oh, there's damage? Steering's off. Not what this says. It's what I say, and I know my ship. Well, its hollow projector would display right over the controls. Looking back at the Ghost, we can use this fan-made schematic to get a grasp on the interior space, with the four smaller cargo holds right behind the cockpit being turned into rooms for the crew, and the airlocks on each side leading to the four cargo holds that line this area, leading to the lounge with simple seating and standard Dejaric table, which also works as their holo projector for mission briefings and transmissions, though Chopper could serve that purpose as well. Then we get to the galley or kitchen in the rear. Going down the ladders into the lowest level, you would have the staging area, while up in the nose you have this rectangular part under the cockpit which contained the gun turret, and another opening to take in cargo here, where you can move it straight to the back to the large cargo bay area here, while the ladder takes you up to the gun turret itself, which had a ton of ship and environmental data panels like a proper cockpit. The crew rooms themselves had bunk beds, small storage areas on the side and under the bed, and have locks on them, but these can be easily picked by a skilled loth rat. The galley is spacious with tons of storage cabinets and devices to prepare food, and a simple table perfect for practicing your Jedi mind powers. All of the cannons can be fired from the cockpit or by the astromech when plugged into the numerous droid sockets. This is something Chopper would do often, showing us that he had become quite a good shot. He would also be responsible for jamming, sending out transmissions, putting out fires, and of course keeping the crew on their toes. And his bravery was recognized by all, as he could take damage simply by being connected via the droid socket. The Inquisitor TIE, a TIE Advanced V1 prototype, is far more powerful than the standard one, and we see these bolts rocking the ship. And though the whole armor absorbs and diffuses the surge from these plasma bolts, some of it is transferred into chopper, and it even caused a small fire in the main controls, though the guns were still operational. The Ghost can handle a ton of direct hits from TIE Fighters even at close range, while having the damage output to take out Gazantes and Arquidans on its own. Through a combo of sheer firepower and Hera's understanding of her ship and her enemy, targeting weak junctions in the armor, placing shots on power and weapon systems or fuel tanks, often resulted in catastrophic failures that even threatened the imp allies nearby. Now this was designed as a cargo hauler, and besides all that internal storage, it can pick up at least five of the large shipping containers made standard throughout the galaxy. And this same mechanism can be used to pick up ships including the Phantom, which was useful when it ran out of fuel. Overall, the Ghost had over 87 illegal upgrades to the stealth systems. On top of the standard engine baffling, which was in place to cover up the heat signature created by the engine array, as well as on top of the energy dampeners and static jammers that came stock. The reason why some of this signature suppressing technology was legal was in order to cut down on the chaotic electromagnetic overlaps at major ports. But what Hera was able to achieve with all these illegal upgrades allowed the ghost to appear like nothing more than a common solar fluctuation or background radiation on the scanner of most ships in the galaxy. Likely using tech usually implemented in larger craft, what most would consider overkill, but which Phoenix Squad would use to slip in and out of Imperial controlled areas at ease. 
Combine all that with the firepower mentioned, and you can see why anybody who knew Covert Craft, like Han and Lando, had an instant appreciation of what the ghost was pulling off. Though something even they would have thought was insane is that there were countless times that Hera would jump to hyperspace without having a route plotted. As Han once put it, Traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. Without precise calculations, we'd fly right through a star or bounce too close to a supernova and then it'd end your trip real quick, wouldn't it? But to be fair, when Hera was certain that if she waited another second, she'd be turned into stardust, she would just press that lever and hope for the best. Even if quantum spaghettification through a black hole was a much longer and painful death. But it is something others like Grease and Cal Kestis were seen doing in this era as well. And Chopper swore that the Nava computer in the Ghost was rude and pushy, to the point that they would often get into fights. Keep in mind this is coming from Chop, so either the Nava computer was even more rude than he was, or he was the problem. Perhaps they were about the same level of trickster. As for its history, Hera would acquire the Ghost about 8 years after the Empire was announced. So 11 BBY, 6 years before the Spectres met Ezra. And ever since she was a young girl, she had dreamed of flying the stars. You get to live on a starship? That's my dream. And through her father Cham Syndulla's efforts to free Ryloth, she met many Clone Wars heroes and then the earliest of the rebel leaders. While the astromech C-110P was brought into the family after a Y-Wing crash landed on the Syndulla compound during the Ryloth campaign. The droid's beloved pilot was dead and his memory and logic circuits were damaged, leading to a form of AI PTSD and some believe it led to his disregard for life. And when Hera's mom was killed, Chan became even more involved in the fight against tyranny, leaving Hera to feel abandoned and she would grow closer to the droid. In 11 BBY, she would also run into Kanan Jarrus during the Gorse conflict, and they came to realize that they were both quite capable at foiling the Empire's plans, saving Gorse and its moon from Imperial destruction. Shortly after this, they would pick up Sabine Wren and Garazeb Borelios, and they worked harmoniously as the Spectres, slipping into Imperial targets via Phantom and Ghost, fitting names for the powerful stealth ship that could both take life and slip away unnoticed. Like the most frightening of legends, they quickly became the stuff of Imperial nightmares. During a routine mission, they would run into a Loth rat named Ezra Bridger, who would eventually be shown to be Force-sensitive and brought onto the crew. But not before showing his resourcefulness as a thief, breaking free by using their air vents to climb throughout the ship. He was now raiding with a rebel cell and training as a Jedi. The Ghost would act as mobile home and Jedi temple for one of the few new Padawans in the entire galaxy, while two of the codenames they would use include Starbird and Tontine as there were numerous times they had to work with more shady underworld characters, or times when they pretended to be bounty hunters serving the Empire. And these missions show how Hera's understanding of the ship allowed her to use systems in ways that weren't intended. Rerouting auxiliary power to the hull. And I do wonder if this could have been used to destroy the tracker fired by the Grand Inquisitor. It may have been too chaotic and risky to pull off in this fight, but you could see how this shocking of the hull could be a part of a good escape hygiene. It could just be something you wanted to do before you jumped to hyperspace, making sure you shorted out any trackers on the surface. And as the Spectres became more trusted within the not yet formally organized Rebel Alliance, they would also work with Saw Gerrera's partisans, joining efforts after the Ghost confirmed reports that the Empire was involved in grand building projects, something that was requiring enormous amounts of kyber crystals. Though with the larger vision and structure, it threatened to sacrifice their members to the greater mission. When Kanan was captured, Fulcrum gave orders not to risk their entire cell by trying to rescue a single member, with him being taken to Mustafar. But Hera's own droid would distract her, letting the rest of the Spectres sneak off with the Phantom. Eventually they were able to rescue Kanan, and Fulcrum knew that now that the entire crew was involved, they were too valuable to lose, giving the order to send Phoenix Squadron CR-90 blockade runners and the Ghost to assist. This did ensure the survival of one of the most valuable units in the Rebel movement, resulting in the death of the Grand Inquisitor and destruction of Grand Moff Tarkin's Star Destroyer, Sovereign. To hunt this ghost down, imps like Agent Callus had to get creative and monitor his own for any that might defect to the Rebellion. His bait came in the form of Imperial Minister Makath Tua, which nearly led to Darth Vader capturing the Spectres. This led to the ghost playing a crucial role in the defense of the Phoenix Fleet, with Vader's TIE Vance destroying their flagship Phoenix-1, along with squadrons of A-Wings. It was only through her expert piloting skills that she was able to slip between the Star Destroyers and time the tractor beam activation to trap Vader and escape through hyperspace. It was through her use of the B-Wing that got Hera promoted to Phoenix Leader, and shortly after the Ghost was able to free Jun Sato's Corvette, Liberator, from the tractor beam of an Imperial Star Destroyer. By using Sabine's expert knowledge of the Imperial weapon systems, she knew the exact device to hit, and when the Ghost's forward cannons were destroyed, Hera simply rammed the projector, breaking it off and allowing the Rebels to escape. 
Then they would make it seem like the Rebellion stole Sphyrna-class Hammerhead Corvettes being delivered by Princess Leia Organa. This is just one of the many times that Alderaan would be a convenient victim of rebel attacks, leading all in the ISB to know, but not be able to prove, that the royal family was helping build a rebel movement. From here, the Ghost would become the first ship in millennia to navigate through the star cluster that hid the Lasat homeworld of Lirasan. The Ghost's controls would be manipulated by the mystical bow rifle, which was a force-connected weapon not too dissimilar from a lightsaber. With the old priestess, they were able to survive the nebula that shredded all form of ship that tried to pierce this veil. And they would either have the coordinates mapped in the navicomputer, and, or more mystically, it may have been some aspect of the force itself that was welcoming to the Ghost and its pilot. When they ran into Purgle, Hera wanted to open fire on the hyperspace swimming space whales. They'll rip the hull apart! Prepare to fire! We gotta drive them back! Don't shoot! Ezra was surprised by her violent reaction. But later when they survived this stream, she would explain the destruction she had seen. The Purgle are dangerous. They wander into hyperspace lanes, crash into ships. I've lost more than one friend that way. The Purgle would lead them to a gas refinery that would provide valuable fuel for the Ghost and the entire Phoenix Squadron. The ghost would be home to a reunion for the Syndulas, but her father was still upset that she chose to save the galaxy before she could even liberate her home. If you gave me half the attention you gave this second-rate junk pile, we'd have liberated Ryloth by now. But when their mission proved successful and the Imperial transport was destroyed, with reports of their people rising up all over Ryloth, he could see how the Phoenix's method of spreading sparks throughout the stars would eventually burn down the Empire. Ghost would continue to act as a mobile Jedi temple, hosting Ahsoka Tano at times, and continuing Ezra's training in everything from meditation, holocron studies, and lightsaber combat. They would find and establish Chopper Base, one of, if not the lead rebel base before Yavin. The local spiders would have to be fought back in order to establish a perimeter, and Hera was horrified to see that their webs were able to keep the ghost pinned even with thrust at full power. The old whole shock trick stunned them for a second, but it wasn't strong enough, and she says that they can't just keep zapping their power away. No, if we drain too much power, we won't be able to lift off. The bugs were able to open the airlock, and once they realized that the beacons could be used to repel them, Chopper Base would be relatively calm. The Phantom would then be used to travel to Malachor, in one of the most important missions for the Jedi survival since Order 66, with Tano, Jarrus, and Bridger discovering that Darth Maul was still alive, while fighting off Inquisitors and finally Darth Vader, among the ruins of an ancient Sith temple, and setting it all to self-destruct in a blast that consumed Tano. A blow to Kanan's faith in the future of the Jedi Order, and the loss of one of the highest ranking members of the Rebellion. And after this touch with darkness, the Phantom would be destroyed over Reclam Station. After being cut into by the automated defenses, these descendants of the Buzz Droid, it would later fall to its doom as debris crashed into it, knocking it off its magnetic hold, as the entire station was going up in flames. While Kanan and Ezra were responding to what appeared to be an attack on a Sphere class corvette by an Inquisitor, Hera made a call to them, revealing that Maul had captured the Ghost and its crew. As he studied the interior, he realized how much it meant to him. I assumed that this ship was merely a transport, but I realize it is much more than that. This is your home. In their attempted escape, they would use the magnetic clamps of the main cargo hold to pin Maul's mechanical legs, though he was too powerful, and they would only be free of the old Sith once he got the intel he wanted. Sabine would realize just how much the Empire was haunted by the Ghost when she went undercover at an Imperial Academy, one of the TIE pilot simulations focused on the Ghost swooping in to protect a rebel ally, showing Sabine just how well they understood the ship and its capabilities after all these years, having it pop out of nowhere and quickly eliminate everything in its path. Ah, but you are wrong, Cadet. It was a transport called the Ghost, which has been modified for combat. The Rebels are a desperate group of extremists. They'll fight with any ship using any means necessary to undermine our authority. From here it would be a homecoming that would further prove that Cham Syndulla and the Free Ryloth Movement would benefit from being involved in a larger alliance, with the ghost soaring in overhead to make quick work of an ITT, and though this scout trooper showed why they were elite, his fancy speeder bike work only helped to add his helmet to Ezra's collection. Hera would learn that the Imp had set up a base in their old family home, and though she failed her personal mission to save a precious family heirloom, they do eliminate the Empire's forward base on Ryloth. In their next heist to scoop up proton bombs from an old CIS wreck, they make an unlikely ally in the form of a T-Series droid that was convinced to see the Empire was the true enemy of the Separatist holdouts. And in their escape from an Imperial strike team, Spectres managed to secure a replacement, the Phantom II, which was a Sheathapede class transport shuttle. This was slightly faster at 1250 km per hour, now past the TIE fighter, and was roughly the same size with the exact same passenger capacity. 
and similar damage output, just not with the versatility of a top-mounted turret. There were just the two forward-facing cannons and two rear-facing. On one mission to help rebel sympathizers, they run into another Corellian creation, a YT-2400 light freighter that was the home ship of Iron Squadron. In the battle that ensued, eventually the 2400 would need to be rescued, and the magnetic clamp saved the day again, grabbing hold of the ship when its engines and hyperdrive failed. When they go to investigate the reports of the disappearance of the Geonosian species, we see them referring to environmental displays in the cockpit, showing both topological data and energy readings. And after they search through the depths of the structure, the team discovers Saul Guerrero, and then a Geonosian named Click Clack, who is warning of some strange circular object, and guarding a Geonosian egg. The ghost would have to make a narrow descent through the cave opening after the enemy had spotted this ship and realized what a catch it would be. Imperial records identify it as the ghost from Phoenix Squadron. The ghost? If we destroy that ship, it would mean a promotion for all of us. Meanwhile, Saul was not being respectful in his friend's home, threatening to kidnap Click Clack and steal the Phantom too angry at the slow and cautious methods of everyone but his partisans. As they fled the Imperial waves of attack, they descended further, finding gas canisters used to fumigate the hives and carry out this genocide, attaching them to the ghosts like cargo containers. And on their way out, the Arkwadens tries to stop them, but Hera saw an opening. Their captain is showing their inexperience. All hands, fire forward batteries, Sabine, fire proton torpedoes. But this maneuver would knock loose the evidence. Following this, it would be on Ghost that Fen Rao would explain the history of the Darksaber, and while running a refuel mission, we can see massive tanks attached to each side being used to refuel a Tayland shuttle that would be revealed to contain Mon Mothma. The Empire knew the sway she would have over countless worlds, and threw everything they could into finding her, including the newest ship in the Thai line, the fast, deadly, shielded, and hyperdrive-enabled Thai Defender. Mothma would be forced to take refuge in the Ghost, and in trying to lose the Imps by crossing through the Archon Nebula, the ship suffered intense radiation, only to run into a pair of ISDs. Mothma stalled while they calculated a hyper route, but it wasn't long before this freighter was pulled up by the Star Destroyer's tractor beam. Hera tells the Y-Wings to fire their proton torpedoes into the nebula, exactly what they were avoiding while passing through it, but it now worked to unleash a massive burst of plasma and radiation that worked to overwhelm the systems in the capital ships, dropping the tractor and allowing them to jump to Dantooine, where Mothma would make one of the most important speeches in galactic history aboard the Ghost. We will not rest until we bring an end to the Empire, until we restore our Republic. Are you with me? They would then turn their efforts to the liberation of Lothal. At first they wanted to steal Imperial codes, sending Chopper and AP-5 to go undercover, but the C-1 would be spotted by a sharp-eyed slicer, and the droid was hijacked after it ported into the station. With an Imperial in control of Chopper, they searched his memory banks and see this may lead them to the capture of the near-mythical Spectres, and the Rebels' new hidden base. Chop would place a spike and transmit data to the Imps, and they try to lock everyone in the cargo bay, before opening it up to the void of space. Hera deduces what must have happened, and backhacks them, taking it personally, and ensuring she overloaded the modified Imperial Spy Gazanti. Thrawn was able to figure out the location of Chopper Base, and one of the largest battles since the Clone Wars was quickly underway. Six Star Destroyers, two Arquidans, and two Interdictors were in orbit, and the Rebels knew their only chance was to create an opening for Ezra to escape, and to get help from their Mandalorian allies. Jun Sato watched as his friends were being killed all around him, and gave orders for his crew to abandon ship and crashed his carrier into the gravity well-generating cruiser in order to give Ezra a chance to jump to hyperspace. Hera would lead their decimated forces back to their base, and after their shield generator held up against the orbital bombardment, Thrawn personally led the ground assault. When all seemed lost, aid would come from the mysterious force wielder, the Bendu, along with Ezra and the Mandalorians. All the rebel ships scattered, as force lightning at a scale Sith could only dream of was raining down and giving the Ghost a chance to race away, forcing some of the tightest flying yet through swarms of TIE fighters, making sure to rescue their Imperial defector friend, Agent Callus, locking in his escape pod to the underside of the Ghost as the stunned imps watched them make the jump. Hera would tell them to plot three hyperspace jumps before they went to the rendezvous on Yavin 4, and at this base, Saw would make his appeal to those who made up the Rebel Alliance, calling Mothma a coward who would sacrifice the entire galaxy on the altar of her supposed virtues. But if they wanted to win, the Rebels should be joining the Partisans. Hours later, the Spectres were off to place a spike in an Imperial Relay, using the cargo door like a military aircraft to drop in Ezra, Chopper, and Sabine. And after they were detected, it was a chaotic mess trying to make it out alive, with the Arquidans releasing its TIE defenders. A pair of these new TIEs was able to push Hera to the point that she had to use the Fog and Kanan's vision in the Force in order to get the upper hand. 
all while Saul Guerrero had arrived in his U-Wing, dropping off proton bombs and picking up the Spectres. Sandula was confused and then worried when she heard who it was that saved them, made worse when an ISD appeared and forced them to quickly split up to escape. Saul brought them in on his mission to investigate the rumors of enormous kyber crystals being used in the Empire's superweapon program. While Saul was set simply on destruction, Hera was happy to see that her specters were focused on saving the innocent civilians that were trapped on board the transport. The Ghost would swoop in to save them, all of whom would become dedicated members of the Rebel Alliance. The liberation of Lothal would require the movement of several pieces, including some tips from the old pirate Hondo on how to smuggle the Ghost past an Imperial blockade, and would play a pivotal role in the battle that would capture Arenda Price. Before they carried on to their second stage, the most difficult part that would either lead to their destruction or the final liberation of his homeworld, Ezra spoke to the image of his late parents in the ship that he had called home for four years, using Price to gain access to the portable Imperial Command Center that was the base of the enemy's power on Lothal. Ezra and Thrawn would go missing as their enigmatic allies, the Purgil, showed up to drag the flagship, the Chimera, into hyperspace to some unknown location. With the base filled with explosives, they would send it far above the city before making their escape via the Ghost, being flown by the young pilot Sato. To see the fireworks show, the entire city was out on their feet, cheering as the symbol of their savior, the Ghost, soared overhead in its victory lap. Less than a year later, now General Sindula would be on Yavin 4 with Chopper, helping continue the fight during the Battle of Scarif, a part of the largest showing of the Rebel Alliance power thus far, the ghosts popping out of hyperspace for the epic battle that would deliver the Death Star plans into the hands of Leia Organa. Over the next four years, the ghosts would continue to strike fear into the Imperials all across the stars, culminating in the Battle of Endor. After the Emperor was killed, and the galaxy was celebrating the dismantling of the Empire, after more than two decades of fighting, she had victory at last and in the following days, the General would set up camp near Solos, and she would finally get another long sought after personal win. The Ghost is a superior ship to the Falcon. Even though Leia was good friends with Hera, she makes sure her husband knew where she stood. By the way, no one believes the Ghost is a superior ship to the Falcon. A year later, General Sindula would be aboard a monument to her service and leadership, her very own Star Destroyer named Deliverance, which she took into the Battle of Jakku to finish the fight against the Imperial Remnant. When it took heavy damage, she ran to her hangar to take the Ghost into battle, which would be considered the final battle of the Empire, all later forms being merely a particular warlord and then the First Order. While the galaxy came into an era of greater peace than it had seen in more than four decades, Hera was making sure the next generation enjoyed her ship, her beloved home, as her and Kanan's son, Jason, loved to ride with his mom, a mom who was surely surprised that she could love flying even more, sharing it with her little co-pilot. Though these moments were to be savored, deep down she knew that the fight would need to be continued, that somewhere Ezra was out there lost in space, and Thrawn was preparing his return, a story which is yet to be told. And when the Chiss's old master, the true incarnate evil of the galaxy, proved to be alive after all these years, the Ghost was part of the largest galactic alliance of ships, leading the charge right behind its rival, the Millennium Falcon, to destroy the Sith once and for all. So that's it for the breakdown, as for behind the scenes facts, the Ghost was first introduced at Celebration Europe 2 in 2013, in concept art for the Rebel series, receiving great applause, and it was rolled out with a series of Rebel pins that contained clues to find the ship's schematics online, found on the article Seen a Ghost on StarWars.com. The cockpit was inspired by the real-world Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, and it was designed for a ship called the Silver Angel, which was scrapped once the final episodes of the Clone Wars were left unfinished, but the Silver Angel will be brought to life with Season 7's return, being used by the Martez sisters. And then there is an insanely obscure reference in the KX-4 laser cannon turret, which was first mentioned in the novel Shatterpoint released in 2003, on board a Turbo Storm class gunship. If you made it this far, please hit that like button, leave a comment, share the video, and subscribe to see more. And thanks again to our sponsor, Pixel Starships. If you're in the ship warfare, customization, space exploration, you're gonna love it, so check out the link in the description. But most important of all, remember, the specter of sleeper freighters have always haunted the Empire, and the Force will be with you, always.